At the end of the Cold War, the Army War College came up with an acronym that pretty effectively described world conditions at the time, and it was VUCA, Volatility, Uncertainty, Complexity, and Ambiguity. I think we live in a VUCA world. Dr. Randy Ross, the mastermind behind the groundbreaking book, Remarkable. Diving deep into Dr. Ross's wealth of knowledge, effective communication strategies, art of crafting a thriving organizational culture. If we have a toxic culture, can it be changed? This conversation about culture is the very heart of it. What do you do to build that trust? And so this is a very good conversation. What is culture? How does it work? How do we improve it? I mean, all of that affects not just the economy, but are we going to hit a recession? Are things going to continue to escalate in terms of living costs? What can we do about it? Organizations try to negotiate and navigate all these tumultuous waters. Chick-fil-A surpassed their top five competitors combined. $19 billion worth in sales. But what does being the world's most caring company have to do with selling chicken? Tell us. And that's the key. Wow, jeez. You're listening to... Welcome to What The Tech, your gateway to business strategies and tech secrets shaping today's workplace. Hey, Dave, do you think that company culture is spontaneous? Like it's happening like an amoeba and it, it kind of comes together just kind of <laughs> organically? Or do you think that it's manufactured? It's an interesting thing to think about. You know, I've I've been part of organizations that have a very positive culture. I've been involved with some that are not so positive, somewhat toxic, somewhat threatening. So, you know, I'm interested to dive into this topic today. Well, we've got someone that can help us dial in exactly what that means. But I got to tell you from my experience around different organizations, as well as playing sports and having different head coaches at that, every head coach has dictated the pace, tone, language that the team uses and the edict comes from the head coach and everybody takes their cues right. from there. And I've been under a regime that was very strict. One that was really loosey goosey, just win, do everything you got to do. It doesn't matter. I kind of turned a blind eye. Nothing ever was said that way, but we took our cues from the leader. And I'd love to see what Dr. Randy Ross, who's on the show today, what his perspective is on that. And what can we do? What can we do about it? You know, if we have a toxic culture, can it be changed or not? Or, so or is it be interesting to jump that, into that with him today? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Looking forward to this. All right. So before we get to Dr. Ross, let's give some big props, Dave. Big props to Luke Mix Kaminsky, who really opened our eyes when it comes to big data and AI and what's happening in that world. It is changing. It is moving fast. It's evolving. And he had some really good takes on that. So if you want to go check that episode out with Luke, go ahead, check that out. But also, yeah, Luke, thanks for coming on the show. So let's get right to introducing our guest, Dr. Randy Ross, who is the founder and CEO of Remarkable. Let me give him a proper introduction on who he is and what he's done. Dr. Randy Ross is the mastermind behind the groundbreaking book, Remarkable, Resolving Your Most Important Business Issue, where he unveils the secrets to achieving remarkable success in today's competitive landscape. Are we in a competitive landscape? You better believe it. Through his captivating writing and dynamic speaking engagement, he ignites inspiration, sparks innovation, and empowers leaders to reach new heights of excellence. Today, we're diving deep into Dr. Ross's wealth of knowledge, exploring everything from effective communication strategies to the art of crafting a thriving organizational culture. Looking forward to that. So whether you're a seasoned executive, an aspiring entrepreneur, or just simply someone hungry for actionable insights, you're in for a treat. Without further ado, let's jump into the conversation with the incomparable Dr. Randy Ross. Woo! If I can channel what an intro. Nature Boy, Ric Flair. <laughs> I don't know if you watched any of that WCW stuff when you were younger, Dr. Ross, but I love the Nature Boy and his woo! Well, it's, uh, it's an honor to be with you gentlemen, and that's quite the introduction, Rolando, so thank you for that very much. Would you like us to, to use Dr. Ross, Randy, Randy, Randall? What do you prefer? No, Randy's fine. Oh, okay, Randy. Okay, we'll go with Randy. No, we're, uh, we're friends. 
<laughs> yes, indeed, we are. You know, thinking, of, you and I had the opportunity to, to chat not too long ago, and we, we talked about a number of things. And as we were getting ready for this, we were thinking, you know what, how could we really dive into some of the company culture stuff, your book, which is amazing, and some other things that are relevant right now. I'd like to kick it off with your thoughts of, on this. We're going to play a clip, and then we'll jump in and, and kick off the conversation with this. Go ahead and roll that, Ori. Coming off what it called a difficult and disappointing year, UPS announced it's cutting 12,000 jobs. On its earnings conference call Tuesday, UPS said the move would help save the company $1 billion. The world's largest parcel delivery firm is in part being squeezed by higher labor costs from its new contract with the Teamsters Union, which was ratified in August after contentious negotiations. UPS also warned of declining daily volume, which it expects will be weak in the first half of the year before recovering in the latter half. But even then, growth will be constrained. The delivery giant said volume, revenue, and operating profit declined last quarter for all its business segments. It also forecast revenue for this year that was below estimates. That sent shares down nearly 8% in Tuesday morning trading. But UPS, which is viewed as a bellwether for the global economy, did say business conditions would improve in the second half of the year. So that's a mouthful of what's going on right now with big companies, tech companies, and, and something that wasn't said there, but was in other outlets that reported this, they were saying that one of the things that is going to happen is that they intend on using more AI to replace some of those managerial roles that would be laid off. So they're not rehiring, they're not outsourcing, they're not bringing in low cost labor, or I guess unless you define AI as low cost labor. What do you think about what you just saw? Well, that's a, a, a whole ball of wax, you know. To <laughs> you can go in any direction you want. Yeah. I mean, we're we're facing some really interesting economic times. Uh, there are a lot of challenges on the horizon. And it reminds me back at the end of the Cold War, the Army War College came up with an acronym that uh, pretty effectively described world conditions at the time. And it was VUCA. There's actually VUCA training. You may be familiar with that. But VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And I think we live in a VUCA world. I think post-COVID with not only all the, the political unrest, the economic unrest, the forecast on the horizon, you know, are we going to hit a recession? Are things going to continue to escalate in terms of living costs? I mean, all of that affects not just the economy, but individual organizations as they try to negotiate and navigate all these tumultuous waters. And I think for me, one of the things that I really enjoy doing is helping organizations get a different perspective, changing VUCA into CAVU. CAVU is another acronym that you may be familiar with, but it's used by pilots. And it stands for Ceiling and Visibility Unlimited. That's interesting. You know, you just change a few letters and you go from VUCA to CAVU. But CAVU means that when you are experiencing stormy weather, if you can elevate yourself to the point that you get above the cloud banks, and you probably experience this, you know, commercial flights all the time, when you take off, the the uh, the weather is bad, the, the, the plane is being tossed around by the winds as you climb through the clouds, and the window is being streaked by the, by the moisture and the rain in the air. But then once you rise above the cloud banks, it's unlimited visibility. It's all blue sky. It's clear sailing. It's not bumpy. It's not rocky. And I think the key is to help organizations turn VUCA into CAVU. And you introduced our whole segment, this conversation about culture is the very heart of that. You know, mm -hmm. what is culture? How does it work? How do we improve it? Is, it? is it something that we can seriously impact or does it just naturally evolve? And so this is a very good conversation if we're talking about transforming VUCA to CAVU. And do you believe that, and as Dave and I were talking in the intro, do you believe that organizations have company, and again, this is a generic term, it means different things to people. And with our evolving work environment, because the work environment today in 2024 is not what it was in 2014, is not what it was in 1914, essentially when uh, Henry Ford brought in the five-day work week, 40 hours, right? basically at an assembly line. And we've been stuck more or less with that model up until recently for more people to participate in remote work. And people are throwing the word company culture around and it tends to go to company culture means what we do in the office. Do you have a different definition for that? Well, 
culture is something that's bannered about quite a bit. I mean, that whole conversation about what culture looks like, what it involves. But let me define culture from our standpoint. Culture is the collective expression of the values, the beliefs, and the behaviors that individuals bring to any work experience. And so it's the collective expression of those values. So culture involves not only the behaviors, but behind the behaviors are a belief system. And though it's fundamental and is the bedrock for the belief system are, is the values construct, which gets into some principles of, of axiology, which I think are uh, impactful and transformative when it comes to building a strong culture. Now, you mentioned axiology. You, you mentioned that during our, our first conversation. Please tell us what that means for those folks that don't know and if just hearing it for the first time. Okay, well, axiology is a, a strain of philosophy. And it, by definition, it's a, uh, an attempt to define and measure good, but it has to do with values, value constructs, and value creation. You know, value creation, again, is one of those terms we throw around a lot. We want to bring value, we want to create value, we want to add value, but very few organizations and people actually know how to do that by applying practical principles of applied axiology. So what I like to do is take this very heady concept and simplify it and deliver it to organizations in such a way that they can not only understand the principles, but they can apply the practices that will move their culture in a northerly direction. And so uh, it's a very, very a powerful group of principles. It's about it's about creating movements of good within organizational life. If you just kind of wanted to have a, a synopsis of it, right? So let's just let's put on our let's use the UPS for example, right? Um, we've got an announcement of layoffs. It's going to hit the company um, quite hard for a lot of people uh, who've been there for a long time, and. Um, you would you would probably agree that this is some change that's going to be happening, some transformational change. And if we want to create a movement for good, how do companies like UPS and others that are doing just that? Um, you know, I just read something the other day about a lot of tech companies gutting their DE&I program. And it's super red hot right now because there's, a, you know, being thrown around in a lot of different directions. How do you create a movement for good? in this current environment with companies like UPS that are transforming the workplace, that are doing layoffs, that are going in the direction of uh, AI. How do you, where do you start with that to create that movement of good? Yeah, boy, this is a, a great, great conversation. I think that if you wanted to just make it really simple, you do everything you can to take care of your people. Mm -hmm. okay. It's as simple as that. Um, because there are two kinds of organizations. There are, organizations that use people to grow the business. And there are a lot of those out in the world, but the other organizations are organizations that use the business to grow and then the people will grow the business. So the question becomes, you know, what difference are you making in the world? What difference are you making not only for your clients, but what difference are you making for your own, for the people that, that constitute the organization? And I understand this is not a simple thing. It's very complex because you know, UPS, by laying off such a large amount of the labor force, yes, they're saving a lot of money, but what in the long run is going to be the impact of that on the culture? Will they ever be able to, once again, regain the confidence that they're going to lose through such a severe layoff? And you may say, What's well, your experience? Can I, let me jump in here. Because yeah. you've, you've talked to really big companies. You've talked to Delta and consulted with companies like Delta, Berkshire Hathaway, Chick-fil-A, you have a long list of companies that you've advised. What's your experience? Because the layoffs have been happening as, as long as I've been in the workforce. But right. it seems like it's a little different breed this time. What happens or, or what have you seen when this type of movie plays itself out? Okay, well, first of all, let's talk about the simple fact that sometimes there's no way around it. It's absolutely necessary to, to eliminate some positions or scale back on your workforce. But in those circumstances, how you do that, how you go about it still plays into, are you taking care of the people? Meaning that, are you educating them? Are you informing them? Are you providing them with resources to make a healthy transition? Or are you just saying, hey, thanks guys, we appreciate it, see you later. Hmm. That, that's first and foremost, it's how, how you create that employee experience because that employee experience is gonna cascade down into your 
Customer experience. How you treat your employees will directly impact how your customers will be treated. And, and does your organization take pride in the fact that you put people above profit? In other words, if you want to get down to the essence of it, talk philosophy, what's the purpose of business? Well, a lot of people would say, and most MBA programs would tell you through some, you know, very flowery language that the purpose of business is to make money. Indeed. And, and now, now watch, you know, I, I would say if you don't make money, you're not going to be in business. Mm-hmm. But is the purpose of business really to make money? I think there's a deep purpose to business. And that's this. The business exists to improve the human condition. In other words, businesses should exist to solve problems in the world. And as we solve problems, we're talking first and foremost about problems that we can provide answers for for our own, taking care of our own people. And then they take care of the product, the delivery, the customer, all the way down the line. So the question is, do you put making a difference above making a dollar or do you put making a dollar above making a difference? If you put making a difference above a dollar, here's what I can guarantee you will take place. People will gladly pay full price for those things that they deem bring true value to life. And another universal axiom is that people like to do good business with businesses that do good. So the the balancing act that every organization has is do we cut out those things that are important for the growth and development of our people to save a dollar? Or do we make those cuts knowing that it's going to impact our people in a negative way? I think one of the challenges is, and you've already mentioned this, um, when the economy gets tight, um, when there's fear of a recession on the horizon, some of the, the most impactful people programs are eliminated. Learning and development, the and i you know, all those areas that help elevate the people are first things to go and are eliminated. But those. Why? Why is that? I mean, you would think you just said it. And I would imagine, I know we talked to a professor from University of Chicago, and she's basically saying what you're saying and yeah. added that you treat your people well, you pay them well, you're fair with them, you're profitable, even in good and bad times. But why is it so hard for companies to embrace what you just said, knowing knowing that investment in R&D and people is what keeps the company going. The engine keeps chugging. Why is that so hard? I think it's harder for publicly traded companies. Ah. You know, we got this, we got this fiduciary responsibility to our shareholders because they want to make money off of their investment. And so there's a lot of pressure to exchange short-term benefit for long-term value because if you invest in your people and it's costly to do that, it's going to show a short-term loss. Well, if you're driven by quarterly returns, it's going to be a very difficult proposition to convince your shareholders that the best thing they can do is invest in something that's costly because they don't see an immediate return. But the organizations that are the best that I've ever worked with and that I've seen are those that don't sacrifice long-term value for a short-term gain. They play looking at the long run. They look, they play looking at the long view because they know that in the short run, it may cost them a lot, but in the long view, they're going to gain immensely more than they lost. So for instance, an organization that's large looking at, you know, have a really constrictive times, what's better to lay off a huge amount of the workforce? I go back to the workforce and say, Hey, we've got, we got a choice here. We can either lay a bunch of you off or we can all agree together. We're going to tighten our belts, ride out this rough season. We're all going to have to take a bit of a loss in the process. Mm -hmm. But would you rather be laid off or or have a setback temporarily? And we try to maintain as many as we possibly can on the team so that when the economy expands again, we're ready and we're willing. I think if organizations were transparent and they gave people that option, that choice, Many people would choose to tighten their belt and they would say, we will take a short term hit if it means in the long run, it's going to be best for the organization and best for us. The problem is that there's such a low level of trust in corporate circles right now because of all that we've been through. What do you do to build that trust? So we, 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 we've, like you're saying, trust is at an all time low, you know, people 
Um, some people want to work from home more. Some executives say, get back in the office or, or else. And, and, and managers are caught in the middle and they say, you know, my team wants me to do more of remote and hybrid. How do you, how do you get to those people maybe caught in the middle between the executive team, the investors, and the frontline employees that m may be having some differences in where they, what they want to do versus what's being demanded at the investor level at the C-suite. How do you talk to those um, managers that are not sure exactly how to not navigate this environment and build trust with their teams? <laughs> well, you're, you're touching on the thing that right now is the biggest challenge in corporate circles because we all know that people don't quit jobs. They quit managers. Mm -hmm. Indeed, I did. <laughs> and, and, and people thrive in relationally rich environments. But the, the challenge is right now, managers are being stressed out because they are caught in the middle. They don't know what to do. They're ill-equipped to create a relationally rich environment. They don't know how to take care of their people. They've got the demands being leveled on them from the C-suite, but yet they know that in order to have a productive frontline team, What's being forced upon them is not going to work in the long run. And so they're caught in this quagmire, and most people are ill-equipped and ill-prepared to face that. That's why this conversation about culture is so critically important, because how you take care of your people is going to define your success. If you have a revolving door, there's low trust. If there's, Here's how we define a remarkable culture. This might, this might be helpful. Go for it. A remarkable culture, as we set it forth in our book, uh, Remarkable, um, is a culture that possesses a trilogy of characteristics. And, and we say it's a place where people believe the best in one another. They want the best for one another. And so, therefore, they expect the best from one another. Now, believing the best in one another speaks to trust, right? Where trust is high, resistance is low. And change in progress can come quickly, but where, where trust is low, resistance is high. And we're seeing so much resistance right now in the workforce that it's, uh, it's alarming, to be quite honest. Low levels of productivity, low levels of happiness, low levels of engagement. There's just there's not this high degree of trust, which leads to a low degree of connectivity and compassion, which is the second part, wanting the best for each other. And then lastly, believing the best so that we expect the best, we draw the very best out of people. That all has to be intentionally cultivated because mm -hmm. every organization, interesting, you know, the way you phrased it when we first started, uh, every organization, wherever people gather, you're going to have a culture, but is the, the culture is either going to be by design or by default. Either you're consciously thinking about it and then always trying to improve it, or one day you're going to wake up with a culture to, by default. It's just going to be there because you didn't give it priority. You didn't keep your hand on the helm of culture. You started sliding sideways. You got caught in the storm. You're adrift. And it's not a place where people are happy. Let me ask you something. Is that then the, the, the culture piece? Is that the, the let's call them the, the pillar or the guardians. Let me use a Hollywood term. The guardians of culture. Is it the C-suite? Is it the managers or is it the entire collective? It's up to everybody in that organization to maintain that the culture or values within that company, or again, or is it just kind of, just kind of spontaneously happening and we're just kind of going along with the plan? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. It is spontaneously happening. Um, but it's best if we all together are on the same page and our values are not only established, but they're embraced, they're embodied, and they're imbued by everyone in the organization. Now, that, let me just put it this way. You're absolutely right. It, the best organizations, it cascades from the top. There's no doubt about it, but everybody comes together. They're unified. They're excited about those values. They, they embrace those values. They live out those values. But even if the, top tier leadership hasn't supported or bought into it entirely, you can still have phenomenal culture within your work subgroup, within your team, 
Now, it's hard for that to be productive long term, because if you don't have support from above, you're only going to be able to have a limited impact with your immediate team. Yeah. But it's interesting. You talked about coaches um, in athletic organizations. I mean, I see this all the time in college athletics professionally as well. A lot depends upon the tone that the coach sets. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No doubt about that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. They they set the culture. They establish the values. They they demonstrate what they want everyone else to do. But it's interesting, too, you know, when you when you read or, or talk with guys like Coach K, Coach mm-hmm. Krzyzewski, um, you know, he For writes. For those who don't know who Coach K, he's the head coach at Duke. There you go. Basketball Thank team. You. There you go. Men's Thank basketball team. Amazing, amazing career. Um, and he talks about in his book how he creates the culture. And it's interesting because what he does is he breeds pride within the team. And he says, he says, you're, you're not just living, you're playing for your family first, for your team, your, your teammates second, for the school third. Take pride in what you do. And so, therefore, he has very, very few rules and guidelines and policies. He just simply says, you represent your family, this team, and the school, so do what's right. Interesting. Interesting. So, in that, in that scenario, you know, when they're putting the, your family is first, are they at the same time using that to, to motivate, but kind of in a, in a tough way? Your family is first. You're not doing your job. You're letting your family down. Like, do you see how when, when they put the family first, you're, you're working for your family. Thus, you need to work twice as hard for us. You need to work on the weekends with us. You need to dedicate more time to us. You know, I've worked for sales organizations that they put you at the head of your family. You're doing this for your family, but then they're threatening that against you. You want, you know, if you fail at this job or if you don't do it exactly the way that we want it to, you are doing your family a disservice. Like I, I do see that kind of both sides of the coin in that type of leadership or that type of culture. Well, you bring up a real good point because here's the reality. Values always compete. You know, in an organization, let's just say in, in the uh, utility space, they have a value of timeliness and they have a value of safety. And the organizations that I work with say, well, safety is first. That's great unless someone's out in the field trying to, to fix an electrical line and they're being pushed to compromise safety protocols in order to meet, quote, a deadline to get things back up and operational within a certain window. So you, you, you can't have it both ways. You have to establish what's priority. What Coach K says is it's basically make your mother proud. <laughs> I mean, that's what he's saying. Don't do anything that, that is going to bring uh, disgrace to your family. Make your mother proud. Now, how that boils down, if an organization says, therefore, that means you do everything we ask you to do. Well, no, that's not that's not the essence of it. The idea is we don't have to have a lot of rules and policies and procedures. Just make your mother proud in organizational life. I mean, think about think about the policies and procedures manuals that most organizations have. Yeah, it's, it's four inches heavy. Thick. It's four inches thick and it's heavy. Why don't we just say something like this? Hey, we trust you to be an adult. Act like an adult. But, but you know this better than I do. You've been on college campuses and I don't know if you played college sports, but um, I've heard those words and I've been in the locker room where coaches say that. And, you know, guys on Saturday night after the game will be guys when they're 19 or 20. And I, I say that to bring that over the corporate environment because people will be people and they sometimes take shortcuts because well, that's the most, for them, most efficient way to get the job done with and sacrificing the values that you're espousing. And that's where coaching comes into play. And that's one of the things that is horrifically undervalued in corporate circles. Is that coaching element? Um, how do you have good, healthy, real-time coaching conversations? Most organizations just say, "Do what you do. If you do something wrong, we'll let you know." <laughs> yeah. And and so the hammer the hammer falls pretty hard when it falls. 
But the reality is we should be having good, healthy coaching conversations with our teams all the time. And back to the to the whole idea, and I'm, I'm being a little extreme, and obviously we do have to have some policies and procedures, manuals. I'm not suggesting we throw all those out. But what I would like to see is more organizations have this attitude, hey, act like an adult. And if we see behavior that we don't believe represents you and the organization, well, we're going to immediately bring it to your attention. We'll tell you when you're not acting like an adult. <laughs> right? And to back to Dave's point, if that, if that uh, demand from the organization does not meet your personal value construct, and there's conflict in what the organization is asking you to do, that's definitely a huge demotivator. You need to stop and assess and go, oh, wait a minute, is this the environment that actually represents my values? I think one of the biggest responsibilities of corporate leadership is to attach personal passion and values, personal values, to corporate objectives. Because when we can do that, then we have a, a dynamic workforce. You know, I, I hear that and, you know, I think about, you, you, you um, are probably familiar with Southwest Airlines and their sure. the way they work, the way they operate. And also, if we were to stay in the in airline industry, prior to the United merger with Continental, Continental was very much the same way in uh, creating a company culture where people actually wanted to be part of the company, even down to the call center level. I've, I had uh, a lot of interactions with their call centers and people within the call centers. They were very proud of the work. They liked it. And th from the CEO down, it seemed like people were very aligned with goals, motivation, and, and incentive structures. How can more companies exercise this type of philosophy and culture building so that they align their goals, th their corporate goals, the values, as well as the incentives? Again, I think it gets back to an attitude, a disposition of value construct that the organization um, establishes and then lives by. It's not a matter of just having the values on a plaque in the lobby. They have to actually live by those. And again, that's what the book Remarkable about is about, because there are some axioms or universal truths uh, of applied axiology. A, a couple of those I'll just throw out here real quickly that help codify a culture. And the first one is the principle of creativity, which just simply says that we're all designed to create value in life. Um, pretty basic concept. We're all, uh, we feel good about doing good. So the, the question that comes out of it is, on a daily basis, do you bring more value to the table? Do you create more value than you take? That's a great it's a great question. It's a great, uh, great conversation to have because when you're talking about individual performers, do you bring more to the organization, to your team on a daily basis than you try to extract? Now, the organization should be asking the same thing. Do we bring more to our employees in terms of growth opportunities, in terms of them being able to pursue uh, career objectives? Do we give them an opportunity to learn, grow, and develop? And do we bring more value to the table for our team in terms of ex employee experience than we expect in return? When everybody comes to the table and they create more value than they take, an interesting thing happens. At the end of the day, there's more on the table that can be shared by everybody who helped create that value. But if everybody who comes to the table is a value extractor, meaning that the organization is trying to get the most they can out of the people and the people are trying to get the most they can out of the organization. And team members are trying to get the most they can from each other rather than bringing more value to each other. Then it's not too very long until there's nothing left on the table. When there's nothing left on the table, the game is over, go home. Uh -huh. And that's what we often see in a lot of these corporate negotiations is everybody's trying to get their piece, a bigger piece. Well, everybody can't do that. And I think one of the things we've got to do is we've got to think about not just our shareholders, but our stakeholders. Who are our stakeholders? Well, there are our employees first. There are our supply chain. There are all of our vendors. Those are our, our stakeholders. They all have a stake in the success of this organization. And if we rob the stakeholders in order to produce for the shareholders, then we've created a toxic environment where, mm -hmm. where our, our stakeholders are not going to trust where the organization is going to go. 
And there's a very, very difficult dynamic for organizations that are publicly traded. And, you know, we were talking about people over profits. You know, this example with Southwest. When I had flown Southwest, um, you had a feeling that it was a positive culture. The employees that I spoke to, they were like excited to share their culture and how they were treated as the stakeholders. They were treat the employees were almost treated as the customers. And then that would trickle down to a positive experience. I think about another ex- associ- uh, another business that you're associated with, Chick-fil-A. My wife recently went to Chick-fil-A and they were closed. It was a Sunday. And when she came home, she said, I was really craving this and they were closed. The nuggets. Said, oh, that's right. That's right. They're closed on Sundays. I've only been to the that restaurant two or three times in my life. But every time that I have been, you've been waiting in line. You've had exceptional exceptional customer service. They've come right up to your car door before you even had a chance to get to the window. They're smiling. They're greeting you. Once they get your order, they're using your name. And when I've driven away from that restaurant, I'm left with like a, these are fast food work. These people are, must be treated fantastic. This is just a fast food business. And like you're totally taken back by uh, this experience that was so positive. So that's one example. They're closed on Sundays. They're giving to their stakeholders. They're not just taking. And then what we receive as consumers is this fantastic experience. Um, right next door to that business is um, Hobby Lobby. Also, when I've gone into Hobby Lobby, fantastic experience. Can I help you, sir? Can I help you find anything? Did you find everything right? Or, you know, it doesn't come off as sarcasm. It comes off as they're looking to offer assistance. Also, close on Sunday. Um, people over profits. So I, that's an interesting piece. That's probably part of their culture that they built in at the very beginning. When we open up, this is going to be part of it, and they've held They've held to that. They they don't seem to have deviated from you know, that that value pillar, if you will. I love this conversation, Dave. Let me just go back and let's talk about those three examples just real quickly. Ginger Hardage, who for years was responsible for the culture at Southwest Airlines, is a good friend of mine. And Southwest, they, they built a reputation on hiring happy people. And their customer service, their, their uh, customer experience has been stellar. You recall what was almost a year and a half ago now when they hit that huge debacle where they had the the uh, the crash of their systems during the storms and they couldn't uh-huh. get everybody rebooked and it was a nightmare. They struggled immensely during that period of time because they weren't able to deliver the kind of service that people had expected. And and they're still struggling to bounce back from that. But but they their intent on trying to regain you know, what they lost previously, Chick-fil-A. Uh, the book Remarkable, by the way, um, that we're talking about, that this is all based upon, uh, Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A, wrote the foreword to the book. And David Sayers, a friend of mine, co-authored the book with me. The book is not about Chick-fil-A, but it's about a lot of the principles that have made Chick-fil-A great through the years, and they've used our book in training. But but the, the key, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but just recently, uh, it was brought uh, out in the in the media that Chick Fil A, this is Chick Fil A, just surpassed eighteen, almost nineteen billion dollars worth in sales, meaning that they sold in two thousand twenty two more chicken than their top five competitors combined. That's Kentucky Fried Chicken, Popeyes, Canes, Wingstop, and Zaxby's. They I know those more. are some bigger competitors now. All right, the KFC. You know, they're around the world with tons, thousands of outlets. Well, interesting. So so those five competitors have almost 11,000, 11,000 outlets, distribution outlets. Chick-fil-A did that with 3,000 outlets. Wow. Jeez. Think Jeez. about it. So you're talking about, here's, here's what makes it so special. I don't know if you're familiar. You know what Chick-fil-A's motto is right now? I don't. Tell us. To be the world's most caring company. Mm. That's, what the, that's what the Red Couch commercials are all about. Acts of kindness. Taking care of people. 
taking care of people, putting people. So you can do that. So what, so you can do that and be profitable. That's kind of what I hear you saying. You can take care of your people. They can be happy. They can go home uh, at least a day. In this case, it's a, it's a retail business, right? They can go home a day counting on it to do whatever they want. Family, travel, whatever they want. Take care make of money. your people. Love your people. So Hobby Lobby, Hobby Lobby, Chick-fil-A, cut out of the same cloth. Give them a day off. Invest deeply in their growth and development. They both have in, incredible internal programs that, that elevate and provide resources for their people to learn, grow, and develop to become better. So that they, whether you stay there or whether you go anywhere else, you're going to be well educated and well prepared to be a powerful force in the workforce. Hmm. And, and so you you train and develop your people so that they can be successful anywhere they go. But you love them so deeply they they want to stay, and that's the key. And I think when you look at Chick Fil A statistics, and you realize that that's the the uh, atmosphere, that's the culture. It permeates the employee experience is what they put on the front burner. And then consequently, Dave, to your point, you see that cascade down to the customer. But what does being the world's most caring company have to do with selling chicken? Nothing. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not what you do. It's how you do it. So can you do So if you can do this, I mean, I, I, I worked at Wendy's. When I was in, when I was in uh, high school and it's not an easy environment. People come through the drive through sometimes yelling, screaming, drunk, all of the above, right? You get all of, all of America comes through the drive through window at times. If you could do this at retail, can employers that are non-retail, you know, financial, mm -hmm. tech, healthcare, they could also do this in their workplace, no? Of course, of course you can. Well, I think the one of the most challenging places to do it is in a quick service restaurant, like you're talking about, mm -hmm. you know, to do this in the hospitality space, but it's so incredibly impactful, but these principles transcend. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about personally or whether you're talking about corporately, all these principles of axiology are transcendent, meaning that they are agnostic in terms of vertical or industry that can be applied anywhere with great impact. Hmm. Interesting. I, 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 I am just, um, surprised and amazed when, you know, we have, we've had similar conversations with the, uh, one of the first, uh, HR executives over at LinkedIn. Uh, we've had a number of people come in and talk to us about exactly what you're talking about, putting people first and the people will take care of the profits. And uh, we, uh, we had a professor come on and tell us that there's a number of studies, num numerous studies that are already proving this and showing the positive impact on stock price. And so for me, when I hear, you know, you know everybody got fired on an email and that's it, they're gone. It just is as if they don't know better or like there was a lack of information on how to do this properly when there clearly is data, hard data that shows like what you're talking about with Chick-fil-A, for example, that um, there's a better way and there's a way that it'll create more profits than we ever think about. Oh, absolutely. And um, the whole idea is pretty simple to understand, more challenging to put into practice, but it's simply this, that, Happy people do better work. And people do better work when they're happy doing the work alongside people that they enjoy. And so the key is, how do we as leaders create relationally rich environments where people can flourish? And that's, that's what Remarkable is about. But it's also about, you know, I wrote another book not too many years ago called Relationomics, The Power of Healthy Relationships to Drive Business. And back to the crunch that you're talking about, that frontline manager is oftentimes the most ill-equipped person. They're well-intended. Maybe they were a great subject matter expert or they were a great individual contributor. Now the organization has tapped them to be a leader of people and they don't know how to create that relationally rich environment. But those skills can be learned. And that's what we talk about in the book Relationomics. And that's what we consult with organizations about all the time 
is, is how can managers apply principles like open loops of continuous feedback? How do you develop good coaching conversations? How do you address toxic behavior? How do you eliminate toxic behavior? Um, how do you know whom to invest in, who to give a second chance? All of these are basic concepts and principles that many people might say, well, that's just common sense. But I can assure you it's not common practice. Mm-hmm. And so the book Relationomics takes the principles of remarkable and it's very practical mm-hmm. tools that can be used to help organizations grow leaders worth following. Because that's really ultimately what we're talking about. We're talking about helping leaders mature to become leaders that are worth following. And for those that are are listening on the audio side of the podcast, we have the book Relationomics on our video side. And uh, it looks like in, and on Amazon, which is a very hard place to succeed. We are on Amazon. We sell a bunch of IT stuff. You've got a 4.7 rating on that book which is not an easy feat uh, to get anything above four is and sustain that on Amazon is not an easy thing to do. So people are getting a lot of value out of that book. Well, I appreciate that. And again, it goes back to uh, remarkable. And let me just, let's talk about that word for one second. Um, the, the word is powerful. It's the name of our company. It's the name of the book, but remarkable means that you deliver a service or a product. And you do so in such a way that you blow people away, that you exceed expectations, that you you deliver world-class service. You go above and beyond, and you make a positive impact on someone's life, even if just for a moment. But you do it to such a degree that when people leave your presence, they have this irrepressible desire to talk about you and the difference that you made when you were there in their presence. And that's what we're because when people are remarking about you, then you indeed have become remarkable. Um, Robert Stevens, who was the founder of Geek Squad, he made this statement in an Inc. magazine article. He said, advertising is a tax you pay for being unremarkable. (laughs) I love love that. (laughs) Because, Dave, what you're talking about, you know, when you drive away from Chick-fil-A, you're going, wow. And that was a great experience. They were friendly people. That that double drive through line went amazingly fast. They got my order right. And they called me by name. <laughs> Do I know you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, for a for a f- quick service restaurant, that that's pretty darn good. That's very good. Having worked in it myself, I could tell you it is very challenging. You know, the pay is not like you you're not getting rich, right? Uh, but I guess you, like you said, having a frontline manager that is equipped uh, with the right tools makes a difference. I know I left Wendy's, well, I was actually on my way to college and, and the, the manager made me feel a lot less than who I was. And it wasn't a great feeling. And I was like, you know, I don't need this. In a couple of months, I'm going to be somewhere else anyways. And I'm going to move on to something better than this. And I was not going to allow a manager to put me down, even if I'm working at Wendy's making minimum wage. Uh, But you don't have to treat workers like that to get the best out of them. And I really love that about what you're saying. And so what I want to, before we wind up, I want to ask you to look in your crystal ball. You know, there's a lot of change happening right now. If you had to look at things, and I also like looking at things half full rather than half empty. Give me some of the good news. What's what's happening out there that should inspire or we should be aspired to do with what you see in talking to all the different clients that you're talking to? Well, I think the good news is that a lot of organizations are beginning to wake up to the fact that um, their people, the right people, are the greatest asset that they have. Now, I, I often say this in jest when I'm in a conference, I'll say, how many of you believe that your people are your greatest asset? Raise your hand. Most everybody raises their hand. I say, that, that's, that's not accurate. That's not actually true. People are not your greatest asset. The right people hmm. are your greatest asset because the wrong people are your greatest liability. So thinking about the right people, when an organization has a great culture, they, they are both attractive and they are repulsive. They attract the right kind of talent. They repel the, they, they repel the wrong kind of talent. 
And the, the good news on the horizon is that many organizations now are waking up to the fact that our productivity is tied to how we take care of our people. Hmm. I think they're beginning to see that. You know, it, for a long time, the Gallup studies on engagement it was like, yeah, 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 right. Nobody paid much attention to it because they, they were having a hard time seeing the direct impact on the bottom line. Now, there's no question that that, that debate is long past, and we know that how our people feel about the organization will drive the success of the organization. So the question is, how are we taking care of our people? What are we teaching them? Are we respecting them? Are we helping them grow? Back to the trilogy, do we believe the best in each other? want the best for each other, and therefore expect the best from each other. And the best organizations I know are healthy coaching organizations. You know, turnover in QSR, quick service restaurants, is extremely high. Mm -hmm. uh, in most hospitality spaces, it is. But the best companies are the ones that say, you know what, we may have a high turnover, <laughs> but while you're with us, we're going to treat you with respect. We're going to treat you with dignity. We're going to invest deeply in you so that even if you go as a college student, you know, Dave, to your point, I mean, Rolando, to your point, even if you leave us in a few months to go to college, we want you to look back on this experience as one of the best experiences you ever had because we helped prepare you to have a productive career and we built you up and we believed in you and we launched you into a successful career. Because then as you get into the workforce, you look back on that experience with positive memories, with affection and appreciation. Not only have you become a raving fan, but what are you going to do? No, I'm going to talk to people about Wendy's. You should go eat there because the burgers are great. You're going to be an ambassador for the brand yeah. wherever you go. And, and so I guess I guess you cannot be a raving fan because uh, people are into the fandom right now being on social media. You can't have raving fans, I guess. Can or can you have raving fans if you don't have raving employees? I, I think it's next to impossible. I really think it's next to impossible because your your biggest and best fan base should be your team members. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. I love that. I want to let's let's end on that positive note. But before we end, we'd love to play a little game called Rapid Fire. It's a fun little segment. Just to kind of what's in your brain when you hear some of these phrases and words. So, Ori, kick off our rapid fire segment. All right, here we go. I want to give it a start. Then Dave's going to help me out. We'll, we'll alternate back and forth. Whatever hits your brain when you hear these words. Walmart versus Amazon. Wow. Massive scale, challenging to deliver. Favorite social media platform? Uh, for me, uh, I'd have to say LinkedIn. Uh, it's more professionally based. Favorite piece of tech? Oh, man, that's a tough one. Favorite piece of tech. This is supposed to be a flash round, and here I am stalling <laughs> for an answer. Um, I think learning platforms have evolved, and I, I would say the one I'm working with, Rally, uh, is a phenomenally interactive, change-oriented learning platform that uh, I have great confidence in. It's the first thing you reach for in the morning. <laughs> My coffee. Oh, yes. All right. Coffee. Now, I'd love to, this one because I love finding out if there's stuff I'm missing. So what's your favorite podcast, if you have one? My favorite podcast? Mm -hmm. It's got to be What the Heck, What the Tech, don't you? <laughs> hey, hey, all right. <laughs> and other than, other, than, other, than, other than ours, we'll take others so that we can uh, learn as well from what you're learning. Well, I mean, one of the biggest, obviously, is Rogan, and he's got such a great way of delivering uh, solid information in a way that challenges you to think whether you agree or disagree with the perspectives presented. There's great information that comes through that. He's right. certainly, um, if I were to right now, he's the Howard Stern of podcasts, right? Um, uh, he hasn't been dethroned yet, but I'm, 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 I'm sure there's other budding podcasters that are trying to get there as we speak. 
good conversations. I think, uh, you know, some good content comes from that. Thought provoking is what I like. Mm -hmm. He sure does that. I'm also a Jordan Peterson fan. So anything Jordan Peterson is on. Okay. I haven't checked him out. I'll have to check him out. And Randy, excluding your four books, what's a game changing book that you've read? Uh, Victor Frankl. It's a classic. He wrote man's search for meaning. And if you've not read that, it will turn your world upside down and inside out. It's about um, how do you face and embrace some of life's most challenging circumstances and come out victorious on the other side? I love that. I haven't read that book, but it sounds interesting. There we go. Or he's got it up. Um, It's um, it's man's search for meaning by Victor Frankl. Also highly rated as well. so it's available. You want Kindle? It's there and available for the taking. Uh, it's just like, um, well, or he took it off the screen. That's all right. We'll 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 uh, go check that one out. So we've been having a conversation. Oh, wait, 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 before, before. If people want to get in touch with you, they they, they say, you know what? We want Doctor Randy to come in and talk to us because he's got something. He's he's got his finger on the pulse and bring him in and get get the ship going in the right direction. What should people do? Well, it's easy to reach out to me. Uh, first, look at our website, and that's drrandyross.com. Dr. No period. drrandyross.com, and you can find us there. Um, you can get all of our books. Uh, they're available on wherever fine books are sold on any of your online book ordering platforms, from BAM to Amazon to Barnes and Noble. Uh, and you can reach out directly to me, rr at drrandyross.com. There you go. Um, we've, we've got uh, your website as well up on the screen. People can take a look at that. Uh, visit that website. That's drrandyross.com. Check him out. Um, check him out on LinkedIn too. And you've got a lot of posts there as well. And if you want to follow him. Uh, we've been talking to Dr. Randy Ross on culture, how to really uh, get your company culture right creating raving fans. I love that internally that you need that in order to have raving fandom outside of the company. And if you want to nerd out and learn more about how to work under pressure as a leader, you'll want to go check out our last episode with the former blockbuster CEO, Jim Keyes. He revealed how he went from rags to riches. Literally. Remember that Dave talking about his house didn't even have running water, uh, plumbing. He didn't have, he had to, an outhouse as a mm-hmm. matter of fact, growing up as a kid. So check that episode out. I guarantee you, you're going to pick up a thing or two you've never learned before. Uh, and definitely stories about black professor that are under the radar that people are not talking about on why they did not make it. All right. So thank you for joining us today. Randy, we really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Want to have you again because we didn't even get to half the questions that we wanted to talk about with you today. So we've got to stay tuned for the second round with you. So well, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Randy. Go ahead. Oh, absolutely. Rolando, Dave, great to be with you. I've really enjoyed the conversation. And thank you for your time. Awesome. Thank you very much. We'll see you in the next episode. Now, if you're joining us on YouTube, I've got some videos right up here. Dave and I will join you in those episodes so that you can grow your business faster. So go ahead and check out those videos. Dave and I will see you there.